get started. <laughs> so we are in for a treat with our first speaker. Larry Cohen is the CEO of Access Promotions at New York. I have had the pleasure of knowing Larry for many years I've been, and have been able to spend some time with him and his team kind of in New York. And I can tell you that they are some of the most creative people that I have ever seen in the work that they have done. And he has done a phenomenal job over many years now, building his distributorship to $50 million. And he is going to give us a bit of insight into his story and how he got there. So without further ado, please welcome Larry Cohen to the stage. Hi, everyone. So they didn't tell me that this many people were going to be here. So they were fearing nobody was going to show up. And I had no idea this many people were going to show up. Um, so today, they asked me to talk about this journey that we've been on for it's now 28 years. And you know we're at $50 million. We're about 75 people. But I think from what we started from from the very beginning still exists today in the company. I hope to share some of that with you today. But one thing you should understand about our journey and, and about me a little bit is I suck at PowerPoint. Like, it's just not my style. So I'm going to try to do this with PowerPoint. But if I get off slide just because I start rambling on, we'll try to catch back up with it. But the journey was never the journey that you think it's going to be. Because there's some, I was talking to someone here today, and they said they built their business plan in college that they met someone who did promotional products, they found out about it, they wrote their business plan. Like, we had no plan. And as you'll see as I go through kind of our journey a little bit, that this kind of looks like our journey, but with many more paths than this. Um, so let me give you an idea of like who's here today. And this is some stats from Mark and Catherine. 70% of you are distributors, 30% suppliers, 60% are men, 40% women. Four of you are fresh, meaning that you have, don't have a lot of experience, and 60% of you have a lot. Um, fairly progressive, embrace kind of the fashion forward. You're here for a reason, right? You, you paid money to come to Vegas early. You know, you've given up family time, time to do other things that you might be more fun than sitting in a beautiful space like this you know, and coming to Vegas. Some of you love it. Some of us are tired of Vegas. But either way, you're here because you want to learn something. So that's an amazing group. But you know what I see when I look out at the room? <laughs> you're, all, you're all losers. And, and so let me tell you why I think that you're all losers. So maybe I should change that. Maybe you're all winners, but you lose a lot every day, right? But you have good company. And there's a message behind this. And just follow me out. So you all are really in good company. So everybody know who this is? Michael Jordan, you know, one of the best players ever. Um, he has this quote that he's failed over and over and over again, and that's what made him a success. Um, how many times he's missed the winning shot in games, tremendous. But he's willing to take that final shot. Beyonce, she's a Grammy loser in some books, right? Because her close rate's only 35%. And this one, and this is the part that's most relevant to me. So these are, this is all baseball quotes. And again, I put these together, and I don't expect everybody to read through them. But the relevant quote that I kind of think about is, as a baseball player, they say that baseball is a game of, of, of failure. And that sounds weird to most people, right? But if you can hit the ball three out of 10 times, you're going to go to the Hall of Fame, right? So, Let's have the first key to success. And part of when I do this is I want you to have some takeaways from the day. And some of that could just be you know, thinking about how you structure your business or how you approach sales. So this one is about how you approach sales, right? So the key to success is to be prepared for your failure, right? So how you define success, how you define failure, whether it's psychologically or monetarily, those are really critical things that you need to think about. And if you're in sales and you're out there on the, on the street every day, you're expected to fail. But what do you do with that failure? Does the failure motivate you to go to the next door and keep knocking? Or does it motivate you to kind of crawl into the corner and say, I suck at this job, and I'm going to go find something else to do? Um, statistically, they say that in the world, only 3% of people are really good at sales. But yet, everybody in every single job, everybody is selling, right? So the people that are really successful, take this stuff into account and realize that sales is a numbers game. You've got to keep putting yourself out there. You've got to keep 
plugging away at it. And if, you, if you're good at it and you're thoughtful at it, and we'll talk about some other things that I think have made you success, this is really important. And it's something that we have internalized in our company. And we talk about it a lot from the first time somebody starts to the moment they're frustrated that they didn't win an order. Like, you're going to lose some and you're going to win some. But if you're good at your job and you're trustworthy, you're going to win in the long run. And so that was kind of one of the keys that I want to share with you. I figured I'd get start off with something that at least you get one takeaway. If the burritos make you go to sleep, at least you got one thing now that you can take away. And if it's the only thing you remember. Um, so let me tell you a story about a real loser, this guy. And so uh, I blame my parents for that haircut. Um, and it took a lot of years of therapy to get over that, but I've finally gotten over it. Um, so let me, give you, let me give you a little story about how Axis began, because I think it's kind of relevant to hopefully, you know, what we're talking about here today and how I got to where we are, and then we'll go into how Axis got to where they are. So um, this is kind of a, a little bit of my life. Uh, I had a hot dog cart at age 14 where I would go to the governmental center, they had concerts, and I would sell hot dogs and, until I got closed down by the uh, health safety guy and said, you don't have a permit for that. And I was like, oh. Didn't know you had to have one of those. Um, when I was in high school and first year in college, I bought a house, two houses, and renovated them, and so, um, and then sold them. So that was kind of fun. And then the hardest job I ever had was was I was the Coors beer representative at Duke University. Uh, <laughs> the best and easiest job ever, selling beer to college students. Perfect. Um, so, so, my whole life, I was going to be a doctor. 100% sure I was an EMT on a rescue squad. I did autopsies. I worked in emergency rooms. I knew for sure that I was going to be a doctor. I went to Duke. I was pre-med. I was pre-med poli-sci, so I was a little hedging a little bit there, um, and got accepted to Duke Medical School. Um, and two weeks before uh, graduation, I had a midlife crisis. And I had been talking to my mentors, which we'll talk about a little bit here today, who had been with me my whole life that I grew up with, and the mentors, I started saying, which school should I go to? I got, invited, I got accepted to a few, and they were like, well, we want to talk to you about something that medicine's changing, and we might not do it again. We had this to do over again. I'm like, what? I've just now spent this, in this whole path of getting to this place, and now you're telling me that you wouldn't do it again. So I had my midlife crisis, and in that day that I decided not to go, I also decided to dump my girlfriend. What a day, like two weeks before graduation. Um, so fortunately, my girlfriend kind of get, brought a box of stuff to my room and said, well, you're dumping me, here's your stuff back. And I went crawling back, and she said, OK, and um, now she's my wife. And that's, <laughs> so. Uh, and we have a 21-year-old now who's at Duke and an 18-year-old who's at Tulane. So, um, so that worked out, but I, was, I decided not to go to med school. I was really lucky my parents um, support, were supportive of that effort. They didn't make me feel guilty. They said, look, you know, go for a year, try it. I'm like, no one goes for a year and likes it, so that's not going to happen. And I took a year off, and my dean said, look, you were pre-med poli-sci. You've done all this entrepreneurial stuff. You should either go to business school or go to law school or go get a job. Well, getting a job seemed like, who wants to do that? Um, <laughs> So um, I ended up going to Penn Law and took mostly business classes and very little litigation stuff. Um, took a lot of classes uh, at Wharton, because you could do both. And uh, two years later, I quit. So here I am, I guess I'm a quitter or, or a big loser. To sell binoculars. <laughs> Amazing. So I had this idea, which, you know, we go, like, you know, you're sports fan, you grow up, and you go to sporting events. And you wonder, like, they give you this swag or stuff, but like, what does it have to do with the game? It doesn't really help with the game. Like, wouldn't it be great if somebody gave you a pair of binoculars to make your viewing that much better? So this is 28 years ago, 27? Like, so yeah, a long, long time ago. And uh, so we went to China, and we sourced binoculars and met with one of the NBA owners, and he said, oh my god, this is the best idea we've ever seen. He called the NBA, and they said, can you fly to New York tomorrow? And I flew to New York, and they said, we're doing this with you. And what did I do? I quit my job. And then a few months later, you realize that having one, being a one product salesperson is really not the way to go. So again, you know, path kind of just diverging, but kind of meandering my way through. 
And so here I am, the ex-doctor, lawyer, new entrepreneur, age 29. Uh, there's our first Axis logo. Um, and we got started, and we were selling binoculars, and then you realize they're only going to buy those so many times, and now what am I going to do? And um, I had a friend who worked at American Express, which is still one of our big clients, and she called up and said, I need 10,000 mugs. I was like, can you help us with that? And I was like, sure, I'm a smart guy. I can figure out how to do mugs. And hung up the phone. I was like, where would you go get 10,000 imprinted mugs? Like, you know they're around, but I had no idea. And then someone called and said, I spoke to this one guy, and he goes, you know what, you should come with me. Come to Dallas. There's a trade show like that, right? And he said, you come down. He goes, I'll sneak you under the rope because I couldn't qualify because I didn't have three invoices from three suppliers, so I couldn't really get in as Axis. So he said, I'll sneak you under the rope, and I literally went behind the curtain, and I was in. And so that was, and that was great. But I walked in, and I, it was like Nirvana to me. I was like, this is fantastic. Like, I was like the kid in the candy store. I was like, this is amazing because there's so many amazing products, and there's so many things you could sell. And I was like, this is perfect for me. And I was like, so let's see here. And this was me, right? So like Kid in the Candy Store. And somebody asked me recently on a, this podcast I did, what movie kind of describes the industry that you're in? And for me, it was Big or Toy Story. Because you get to be a kid, and you get to play with a lot of products, and you get to see new things. And Toy Story just, you know, that always speaks to me. And, you know, my joke is, is you know, like, I'm like, I'm not clinically ADD, but this industry makes you a little bit ADD with all the different products. And it's perfect for me, because I always like to have things in my hand. I like to play with new things. I like to unzip things and put them back together. It's just one of those things that I love doing. So to me, like, it was like that moment I woke up, and I was like, this is fantastic. But I did have an epiphany about this industry way, way, way back when. And this is what I hope is the most relevant. So that's the part of my journey about this industry was my aha moment about this industry was everybody was talking about selling product. It was product, 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 product. And they never talked about marketing. They never talked about fit. They didn't talk about strategy. They didn't talk about anything other than what do you want with your brand on it? Like, and I was like, that is so ass backwards way to approach this business because this is the stuff that lasts. This is the stuff that people want to get. This is the things that, you know, they joke, they talk about it now because now it's kind of hip. It's like the ultimate opt-in advertising, right? You hand it to somebody, they take it, you know, you got the permission, now you can talk to them, right? And it's great. Um, not on the slide, but I'll give you something that I read yesterday. So there's, a, I don't know if you read the Atlantic Monthly, but there's an article and the basic title of something along the li of lines of, did pens cause the opiate epidemic? <laughs> so when you think about it, and the, the article is really about the power of the giveaway to change people's behavior. And th so it kind of ends up saying the pens didn't cause the opiate epidemic, that you know, Purdue Pharma was pushing the pens and they go see doctors, but it was part of the giveaway. And they cite all these studies about like just a small giveaway can change people's behavior. We know that, right? But my message to you today, if it's the only thing you take away from here, is like you have to have a strategy behind the giveaway. And if you can't figure it out, then one of two things is the client's not giving you enough information or you suck at your job, right? Because you should be smart enough to be able to figure out who the target audience is. And we'll go through a bunch of this stuff. But that's, this is the key thing that I think that you're here. You're here to learn. When you walk around the show and you're working with clients, figure out why they should give something away. So these are the questions you know, that we ask now is like, you know, you're going to do it for brand awareness. You're going to change, you know, can you change behavior? Can you incent actions? And every project that we start off with starts off with themes, target audiences, colors, budgets, locations, past successes, past failures. Like we have some clients say, we will never, ever give away candy. Like why? Because their boss doesn't like candy. So they don't, they'll say that. But, and then say, what would success look like for you? How many trade show visitors? All of these things. And look, sometimes you're just dealing with somebody's assistant who says, get me some stuff. And they will, and they'll get you some stuff. And you can't, sometimes you can't fight the battle. But in your head, you have to start figuring out, like, who is it going to? Oh, it's going to, you know, high net worth individuals. Well, if you're going to give them a, a cheap pen that's designed to go into a hotel room, like, you're doing damage to the brand, right? Because they're going to go, why'd they give me this? And then they're going to chuck it. Like, that's a branding impression. Like, I look at every 
thing that a client does from their, their advertising, their billboards, and everything else as a branding impression. And if somebody picks up something and goes, this is a piece of crap, or why'd they give this to me? You've done damage to the brand, not catastrophic damage, but you're just, just chipping away at that. And, and it may not do work, damage to the brand, but it may do damage to that person's job, right? Like, because then when the CEO goes, who ordered this stuff, right? We don't want any CEO going, why'd we order this? Because I got a terrible response to that. So at Axis, we try to think about a couple things. Because the clients say, well, what are we going to do? And how can we define success? And I'm like, I always think about, will they keep it and use it? Do they like it enough, but they have enough and they'll re-gift it? Or can I put a smile on their face? If I can achieve any of those three, that to me is success. And um, I'm sure there's other things out there. But if you can't accomplish one or more of those things, then you haven't put enough thought into it. Um, I know the, there's a temptation that's really easy to say. Client called up, wanted you know, 500 you know, 11 ounce C cup mugs at 79 cents on a C or whatever that is. If you ask them why they're doing mugs, the answer they're probably gonna give you is, ah, we couldn't think of anything else, right? And nobody drinks coffee out of a 11 ounce mug. That's like half a K cup or something like that these days. Um, so here are some of the things, the keys to our success. Um, so mentors. I was blessed with, and people at our company were blessed with, very early on to having some people that were, that took me under the wing and kind of took me to the show and talked to me about the industry and um, helped me along. And as we were just, a, you know, I worked in my kitchen for four years by myself and had people I could call on the phone. And then as we got bigger and got bigger opportunities, I could call them up and say, do you have a contract? Or I don't, this contract thing, I'm a lawyer, but I don't have a contract for this industry. Or how do I deal with this issue of warehousing? Or I need to do an e-commerce store and I've never done an e-commerce store. Oh, call these guys or wherever. Like, find people that are willing to mentor you. You are here at Common Skew. You have mentors all over this room. First of all, just joining Common SKU is the greatest thing that you could have possibly done to accelerate your business. Because first of all, Mark and Catherine and Bobby and that whole team are really thought leaders and thinkers in this industry. And they are here to make you successful. But beyond that, I love this industry because like what did I say earlier, like 60% or, or higher or distributors here. Everyone will, you could turn to another distributor and say, how'd you do this? And they'll share that information. You know, my industries will never do that. That's all, these are our trade secrets. Like, none of us truly have that many trade secrets. We just, you know, I don't, I don't want to tell my direct competitor, American Express, how we did something. But beyond that, like, I was talking to, you know, Stephanie about a client that we're sharing. And, you know, like, we were talking about the frustrations we both share, you know, with that client. Like, find people that will do that for you. Suppliers want to help. I was talking one time at an ASI thing and someone came up to me and said, you know, I have all the goods shipped to my house because I don't really trust the suppliers. And I was like, oh, let me just tell you, suppliers know everything about your client. Like they know the logo, they know all of this information. If you don't trust the suppliers, you're never gonna be successful. The suppliers want you to be successful. They are here and they're working in this industry because they, because they have tens of thousands of salespeople on, out there selling for them. They want to give you case studies. They want to help you with products. They want to share, you know, um, trend reports or what's going on in the world. They want to educate you. They'll introduce you like, you know, you need to find a new decorator in a certain area. Call a supplier. Say, who do you, who do you have in those areas? The mentoring thing is the number one thing that you should find because no matter how smart you are, you're not really that smart. You only know what you know. And recognizing what you don't know is kind of really important. Um, you know, know what you love. So how many people in here started in sales and then eventually went out and did their own business? So a number of you are doing that, and there will probably be more that will do it down the road. Like, I will caution you about you could be great at sales, and you could suck at running a business. Like, you know, I was talking to a bunch of people here, and they're like, the number one thing that I have trouble with is hiring and managing people makes total sense, right? You were good at sales. People hated managing you. You hated to be managed. Why would it be any different for the people who come work for you, right? So know what you love doing 
and then find a way to do that. Now, it could be that you, you have a company, a bunch of people work for you, and you want to change what your job description is. As I mean, I've changed my job description as the CEO of Axis by hiring people that could take all the things or many of the things that I don't like doing or that I'm not really good at. Like I thought I was good at it, but I'm really not. Um, and get back to the things that I love doing. I love going out and getting new business. I love being in front of new, I love being in front of clients. I love marketing, I love ID. I like doing all those things. I don't like managing the people. I mean, I'm good and I'm empathetic and all those things, but you can really get beaten down in the course of your day when you're dealing with everybody else's stuff. Um, and everybody's stuff is different, right? You know, you, you, you think you're doing this great thing and 90% of people are happy and 10% go like, Why'd you do that? I'm like, well, this was a great thing. Well, not to me. And so you never know. So know what you love. And I would caution you if you're, if you're a salesperson and thinking of starting your business, understand what that really means. Because when you start the business, the amount of money you make could go down for a really long time. Or you, you have to hire employees. Then you got to start paying payroll. Then you got to get a payroll service. Then you got to collect taxes. I'm not trying to scare you away from doing it. But just understand that sometimes you can make a lot more money working for other people then you can start in your own business. Um, we have, I mean, we have access has been really lucky to have a lot of people that are really unbelievably successful in their jobs, like three million, four million, five million dollars in sales. They could have easily started their own business. They recognized that they wanted to sell, and that's what they're really good at. And they didn't want to do any of those other things. And we've been really successful by allowing, by building a structure around that to allow them to go do what they do, and then we support them, you know, on the backside. So, you know, I think we already addressed this. Uh, this is John Kerry from Liar Liar, where he couldn't tell uh, a lie. Um, you know, be honest with yourself. Like, you know, the 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 inertia to try to do certain things or you know get that big client. Like, that can change your business really fast. Like, do you have the cash flow? Do you, can you manage the client? Do you have the technology to be able to do it? Like, it's great to win, but sometimes winning is, like, is, is, is worse than losing because it changes what you do. And then your job that was fun last week becomes really not fun for a really long time. So um, this is really hard. Um, it was hard for me to acknowledge the things that I wasn't good at. Um, and the more I acknowledge it, the, the better my life became. But you, you kind of go through the journey. Like, I, it's my money at risk, and I did this, and I built it, and I did all this stuff. You know, we are such a better company now that we have other people doing operations, and we have someone doing HR. It doesn't mean I'm not involved in it, but I get to do some of the higher level stuff. Um, and it, it could be small company. And again, if you're a one-person company, find a mentor. Find a, 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 like a small board of people that you can go to. Uh, this one seems kind of obvious, but be honest with others. Um, and it kind of goes beyond the honesty of, you know, just being honest, right? We should all be honest, you know, not do the wrong things. But there's a certain honesty that comes with your job. Like, you know, how, how do you make money? How much, how well is the company doing? Like, what do we need to do to be better? Where are we having challenges? You know, all of those things, people, I think, want to, if they're part of a company, they want to help. And they want to be part of something. But you have to be willing to share with them and to be honest with them, the good, the bad, you know, and the ugly. And I know lots of business owners that don't treat their people that way and don't trust their salespeople that way and don't want to share openly. Um, but I can tell you that all the things that you think they don't know, they know. Right? They know if the company's doing well, they know if the company's not doing well. I'm not saying you have to tell them how much money at the end of the year goes into your pocket. That's not, that's not their business. But you know, if the company's doing great, then share. Here's how much we grew. Here's where we're going. Here's what our goal is for every month. You know, we had a goal last year, which was, you know, as you get to a certain size, our goal was to grow 10%. And I think we grew nine. Like 10 was like a random, like, oh, let's go for 10, right? And we got to nine. That's amazing to do, and it gets harder and harder as you get bigger. But if we didn't, if we weren't honest about where we were, where we were going, what we needed to do, um, we would have never have gotten um, to that place. It's next here. OK, <laughs> show me the money, right? That's what everybody wants to make. You want to make more money, you want to make more money, you want to make more money. Um, that is totally fair, right? And, but as a business owner, um, and for the salespeople, I hope you understand this, but as a, as a business owner, kind of that honesty part is, is like you open up 
you know, maybe it's Council Magazine, but like there's advertisements. You can get paid 65% commission. You know, we'll take care of all your other stuff. It's like it takes a lot to run a business, right? So when when we started, you know, this sounds crazy, but there were, you know, the there was microfiche, if anybody knows what that is. And if you were if you had enough money, you could call ASI and they'd send you this massive rack, this metal rack that would fill up a whole room, and they had one catalog from every supplier, and you'd go to this big volume of books that had print that was like this big, and you go, I need a mug, and you go through this book. Um, now we have e-commerce, we have technology, we have internet. Like we have, you know, internet security. You work with big clients, they want to audit your your security stuff. The costs are just going up and up and up. You know, we have to do tax collection now and probably all of you, I mean as a business owner, I'm just giving you a heads up if you're not paying attention, pretty soon you have to collect tax probably in all 50 states. It's scary. Like, you know, and you know there's solutions out there that you can pay for, but they're not cheap um, to do it, but Show me the money. So there has to be that honesty between the salesperson who says, I want to, you owe me this amount of money, and this is what the business needs to make. You know, at one point, you know, we had some people who were saying, you know, but you make this amount of money off of me. I make this, and you make this. And it was kind of like the similar size pies. I said, well, you know, when you go home, your pie looks like this. And my pie looks like this. And you go, well, how's that possible? I'm like, well, you know, I pay the rent. I pay for the health insurance. I pay for these people. I pay for your sales support. I pay for all these other things. And they're like, oh, we didn't really think about it that way. Um, and the other thing about this slide that is relevant to me, and, you know, for those of you who are in sales, when I talked earlier about 3% of people are really good at sales, what I've noticed over the years I've been doing this is that what makes an amazing, an amazing salesperson is not the money, it's the chase. They love to win the client. You know, they want to make the money, but as soon as they win that part, they're off chasing the next one. So, you know, you have certain salespeople that will get up there and they'll say, you know, I made this amount of money this week, I'm really happy, right? At some point, they're not going to be a great salesperson anymore because they're going to reach a point and go like, look, I'm pretty comfortable and everything's good and, and my kids are no longer in college or out of college and so I'm good. As a business owner, you know what? Your costs keep going up and they're happy, like just skating along this way or maybe going down a little bit because their things change. You want people who want to chase the business. If you're every day focused on, I'm going to go get out and get new clients, you're going to make a lot of money and more money than you could ever imagine. But as soon as you get comfortable with the money, I promise you that this will turn to this, will turn to this, because every year you are going to lose accounts. Like we look at, you know, we have a really big base of accounts. We lose between 10 and 20% of our account base every year. Now, that could be one person that bought one time, they don't buy again. It could be a big company that merged with another company. So, but statistically, you're gonna lose accounts, right? They used to, like they used to buy, that buyer left. You didn't have the great connection. You, didn't, you weren't on LinkedIn, so you didn't know they left. And three months later, you call, look, oh, she left three, three, years, three months ago. You're like, oh, well, that's not longer your client. So you have to constantly be looking. So the money's great, but fall in love with the chase. And if you can do that, um, you'll make a lot of money. Um, this one, uh, empower others. That kind of goes back to kind of the same theme here, which is, Find people that are good at the stuff that you're not good at and let them do their job. So we, I have done that like, you know, uh, three years ago, we took somebody who worked for us and made her the COO. She is so much better at running the company than I was because I had all the baggage, right? I ran the business, I grew it up, I, I made all these stupid decisions, all these stupid mistakes all the way along as we were growing. And she's very empirically minded. She is wonderful at her job and everything she does. But when someone goes, I need more support, she goes, okay, well, let's meet again. I'll do some research. And she'll look at like the numbers, like, you know, you're doing this number, but everybody else is doing three X of you. Well, how can you need more support? Maybe you just need to change how you're doing your job. And they go, oh, I didn't realize that. And then they kind of go away, right? Or she looks at them and says, you know, you really are ramping up. Let's put more strong, let's put some more support in place. Because if we do that, things are gonna go in the right direction. You know, we have a good finance person, helps keep everybody, you know, and some of this stuff comes with size, but I do want you to understand that we outsourced a lot when we were smaller. 
and found people to help us with our financial stuff and had people one day a week who was like a controller to another company. She says, well, I'll be the controller for you. So you can find people to help you no matter what size you are. You can outsource so much of the stuff that you don't like doing in our industry. How many people here use artwork services for something or Office Beacon for something? Um, so I'm not endorsing either one of them. I know there are other companies out there that do this, but for the last 10 years, Office Beacon takes all of the invoices we get suppliers and enters them into our system. So we don't have someone sitting in New York like doing that manual key entry. One, nobody wants to do that, right? It's not a great job for anybody who really, unless you, maybe somebody likes it, I, I couldn't do that. Um, but we outsource it, we scan it, we send it the next morning, everything's in the system. They double check it, it works perfectly. We're now using one of those companies to do order entry for us. So we'll send a presentation out to a client, and we do a lot of custom presentations, so it's not just product stuff. And then we'll just highlight the stuff, and they'll write the order to so the next. So they'll write the order, all the details are in the, in the order, and then if the salesperson gets to look at it, hit a button, off and done. So it doesn't cost a lot of money to outsource things. Your payroll, you should outsource your payroll, right? Too much liability. Like, when you, your payroll company can do your HR and make sure that you're compliant. Um, you know, there's a lot of HR rules as a small company you're probably not paying attention to um, that you should because, you know, our world's a little more litigious today than it probably was um, years ago. But empower guys also means something different for me. Like, when I talked earlier that we have people that could have their own companies or the size of their own companies, we've empowered them to be their own, like, little mini business units. And the rest of our team behind them is there to support them in terms of what they do. So we're empowering them to go out and sell and do what they do well. And if they need to negotiate a price with the client to win it, they have the power to negotiate the price. We are not saying, oh, you need to drop it by a dollar. You need to go get approval to do that. Right? They know what, you know, they get monthly reports that shows them their margins and everything else that they're doing. So they want to make money. So we've empowered them to do it. We want them to win business, but we're not micromanaging their day to day. And if we did, they would go somewhere else. I think the average tenure at Axis now is close to eight years for the people that are there, and we have some that are over 20. Um, and some of the salespeople have been there. You know, 12, 15, 17. Um, so I think by doing that, you've, we've, uh, we've taken people that were um, sometimes at other places or sometimes they, they've grown up at Axis and been nurtured. Um, in the last two years, we've taken people that were, we call them, you know, they're account managers, they're all really like inside sales for us. And three of those people have now moved on and become their own salespeople and all three are selling a million dollars a year. Because um, Part of our system, and different maybe for everybody else, is the day one that you come into the company, if you want to bring in, a, you could be just you know, learning the business, but if you know people that could buy promotional products and you bring them in, let's sell to them. And you get commission from day one on it. And if you ever go off and become your own person, they're your client. So those people that spun out and became like million dollars producers, they've been working for years and they've been adding to their base, adding to their base, adding to their base. And then at some point we go to them like, you know, you should be your own salesperson. And some people like jump at it and say, that's great. And some people say, like, you know what? I like being on a team. So I have a woman that works on my team and helps support like the clients that I still have and stuff like that. And she does that and she's phenomenal. And she, she sold all the stuff that she works for me on and she sold $1.2 million worth of stuff. So, We've, we allow people to kind of follow their passions, you know, kind of within what they want to do, and we've given them pathways. Um, this industry is very uh, kind of amorphous in the way that, you know, at least my company, the structure is very flat. The proverbial shit doesn't flow downhill very far, right? The senior salespeople are doing a lot of the things that you know, the more junior people are doing, because that's what our industry is, right? They're still calling suppliers, they're still getting pricing, they're still sitting in vendor meetings, they're still doing all of those things. Um, but this has been really key for us, is to, not to, you know, is to support them and let other people do what they do well and really get out of the way. Um, and let people know that, you're, that this, you encourage them to tell you what they like doing. Like, you, you know, we have people that, you know, we didn't realize, but they love doing social media. They do it all the time for themselves. Well, 
you know, we said, do you want to do social media for us? Like, oh my God, I, 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 you know, I love doing that. Now, they're much happier in their day job because they get to do their day job and their passion play at the same time. So it's, it's find out what they do well um, and let them do that. Um, you know, empathy, you know, I think, you know, and I'm not gonna get into politics today, <laughs> um, but caring about the people that work for you and caring about you're the people that you're working for and all of those things and thinking about how people feel um, is really important. Um, it's part of culture, it's part of everything that goes on. And, you know, I hear how people like, you know, talk to people and you hear how people react to people. I hear sometimes how people are talking to our suppliers and I go over and I'm like, you know, they're the ones who are gonna make you fail or succeed, right? Every day, unless you're a, a distributor that makes stuff, you have the easy job, right? Somebody literally has to sit there and, you know, decorate, you know, 500 mugs. If you've never gone to a supplier and seen how stuff's made, you have to go watch, because you'll never argue over a screen charge ever again when you see how much work goes into making a screen charge. You know, you know, uh, you know, I went to a base, to one of the cap suppliers in, in Missouri. Like, they have a lot of people just, they have run two shifts just doing sampling. One hat at a time, right? And it's amazing, right? So how many suppliers give you, like, you know, free specs? So they'll do free renderings. They'll do vignettes for you. Like, they're all working hard. You have to treat them like you're your partner not like they are your supplier or your adversary or anything like that. And it, and it applies to your clients too. I mean, we haven't done this a lot, but we fired some clients. We just like, you treat us like crap and you don't, you don't ever say you're sorry you don't, and you don't take responsibility for when it's your fault, right? And, and it was like people, <laughs> when we fired this one client, it was this big law firm in New York, like the, the team was so happy and they felt like, like I had their back, right? We, we lost, you know, we, we turned away a big piece of business, but in the end, it worked out really well. Kind of a, it's not really on the slide, but I'll tell you something that we did um, a few years ago. Um, we had, you know, the company was doing well and the business was going great and we were growing and everything else, but you know, there's like, you just know that there's a buzz that like people are complaining about this and you just hear these things, you know, going on. And, and you know, it just beats you down as the, as if you're the operations person. And so we called a, an access all meeting and you know, we closed the doors and we have offices in Boston, Chicago, and they were on the phones. And we said, we are not leaving here for two hours and we are gonna have a bitch session, right? There's no ramifications, no one's gonna get in trouble, but let's just get it all out and let's figure out how to make this place a place you wanna to come to and work every day. And it was, Amazing. So the first thing someone said is, why won't you buy coffee for the office? <laughs> and I was like, what? And, and I was like, we will buy coffee for the office, but that's not my job, right? Like I'd given someone the job to do that and said, go figure out the coffee thing, decide what people want. Some people want beer in the office. Some people wanted a iced coffee maker, some people wanted a coffee maker, and I gave somebody the job, and then it's not really on my radar. Well, it didn't happen, and you would have thought, like, we had murdered somebody when he said <laughs> coffee, and I was like, people were like, yeah, why are you being so cheap? What about the coffee? What about this whole thing? And I was like, seriously? That's the first thing that came up? And, you know, like, $2,000 later, it's gone. That issue kind of went away. But we literally had this session and you know, other things came up. It was about you know, how you communicate and how you follow up on things and whatever. And part of that was the impetus behind getting a COO because I was just being pulled in sales and stuff was falling off my radar and all these other things. But the one thing I said, which got the most kudos kind of online afterwards was, if you're gonna be the person that, bitch, the person that bitches and complains and doesn't wanna be part of the solution, I'm going to fire you. Like, I don't care how much you sell or whatever. I have access because I get to pick and choose who I work with every day. I want to enjoy coming to work. And if I don't enjoy coming to work, I'll get rid of the people that don't make me happy. And maybe our sales go from 50 to 40 or 35 or whatever it is. But I want to be happy. And if I'm happy, I want you guys to be happy. And it really kind of cleared the air 
And then people felt like, okay, now we can have more open and honest conversations. But we had to make sure that, that we were empathetic to what they were saying and we were gonna listen. And then if they came to us and, and gave us something and gave us a solution and we said we were gonna do it, we had to follow through. As a business owner, if you, don't, if you promise something, you don't follow through, you're losing all the credibility. I don't care how empathetic your listening skills are. If you don't follow through, you're kind of gonna be in trouble. Um, fault tolerance. Um, nobody likes, you know, I, I, we started off this thing saying you all are losers, um, but you're not. But fault tolerance is, to me is a really important thing. Like I want people to know that they're allowed to go out and fail, that they can make mistakes because we're not in an industry that does stuff perfectly, right? Stuff gets shipped wrong, it gets decorated wrong, the ink didn't dry, they used an old logo from two years ago, why they still had it, who knows, right? All that stuff still happens. They make mistakes, they, you know, it's supposed to be 50 jackets and they put, you know, 500 jackets and they get decorated, what are you gonna do, right? You have to empower people to make mistakes and not work every day with fear. Anybody who works with fear is never gonna be creative, is never gonna be good at their job, and eventually they're gonna leave, so why invest um, in that. Um, the, the biggest, <laughs> you don't want to have any of these. We had one job that we had to fix for a client, it was $100,000. Um, that was really painful, um, but we owed it to the client and we did it and we moved on and you know, that, that's life, right? Like your suppliers do the same thing. Supplier messes up, what do you do? You know, your job to fix it, your job to make it better. Why wouldn't our clients expect the same thing? Um, and, you know, the, for me, the, the supplier partners that we love the most are the ones, we expect them to make mistakes. And the ones we love the most is when they make a mistake, they don't ask who's going to pay for it. They ask, how can we fix it? And then we'll figure it out afterwards. Same way you should be dealing with your clients, right? We're going to fix it for you, even if it's your fault, which, you know, it's never their fault. Um, but even if it's their fault, your job is to fix it and make them happy because you're saving somebody's job, probably. So that's my perspective on it. Other people may have different perspectives um, on that. Um, have fun. Seems kind of seems kind of obvious. Um, you know, you'll see people not probably not in this room, but on the show floor, who just want to bitch and complain about like you know this supplier went direct, these people are going directly overseas. You know this is going on. You know, get out of the business, right? Like. To me, it's like, if that's all you want to talk about, you know, go do something else, right? There's, you know, my journey was like, you know, this and this and this. If you want to, I mean, maybe that's your personality and people love that about you, but not my style, all right? Um, but people should come to work and figure out how to have fun. Now, it's not like fun, like, you know, your weekend fun or your drinking fun. That's for, that's for eye candy later on tonight. Um, and you'll see lots of sparkly dresses too there. Um, but you need to make the job somewhat fun. And the fun can be the creativity or the way you interact, but find something that you enjoy about the job and find some things that other people enjoy about the job. Um, so it seems obvious, but some people go to work every day and like if you're the owner of the company and you're grumpy every day because business and you'll enjoy doing it, you know, maybe it's time to, you know, get a coach, right? Have someone figure out, I'm not saying sell your business because maybe that's not what you want to do, maybe it's not the right time to sell it, but get a mentor, get someone to help you get out of that funk you know, and bring the, bring the, the fun back to the office. Um, be different. Um, we're, in the, we're in the business of everybody sells the same stuff. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, you're going to walk the floor, you're going to see the same things, you're going to do all of that other stuff. You've got to be different, right? And the next part of this presentation, I promise it's going to speed up, is I'm going to show you some ways that Axis tries to be different every day. But you have to try to figure out how to do that. And the strategic part is part of it, your creativity is part of it, it's packaging, like, you know, in the last few years, it's all about packaging, right? You can package cheap, you can get, you know, there's, you know, companies like Box Up. You want to make one custom box? You know, make one custom box, right? It's cost you $6, $7, $10, you know? You used to have to do 500, 5,000, now you can do one, right? How impressive is it? You send a new business prospect a box and their name's on the box, right? That's amazing. Um, and this is a big one for me. Never believe your own bullshit, right? So I get invited up to do this, and it's, it's an honor to be able to speak before you all. Um, it's great that Axis is at $50 million. 
I don't really get I, it, it, it's, it. It's I'm proud of it, but it's not what drives me because we could be a much smaller company and I would enjoy the business just as much. And if I believed all the stuff that people say about, you know, Axis being the, this company and then you're at 50 million and you're so great. And you're so great, you know, suddenly you do, you start believing that and then you're not the same person you were when the company was coming up like this. So every day I try to think about this and, you know, I say all the time, like you go to a company's website, you're, look at your own website, right? It better say really good things about you because if you can't say it about you, no one else is going to say it about you. But so don't believe all the stuff you say when you stand in front of the new business client and you tell them all the great things that you can do. You probably can't do all those great things. It's probably some of it's probably bullshit, but you can figure out how to do it if they give you the opportunity. So you're, you're upselling a little bit, right? But don't believe that because if you believe it, you're going to kind of be in trouble a little bit. Um, and this is the other one I believe is, you know, don't live in the past, right? There, you know, we've had people that have come to us from other companies and they're like, I used to sell, you know, $2 million. I'm like, well, you lost all those clients. You're not selling $2 million anymore. And by the way, they're still talking about those same stories and they're not selling. Like, the past is the past. When we lost that $100,000 on that order, people are like, how do you sleep at night? I'm like, it's never coming back, right? Th that's in the past. Like, you made a mistake, you move on. Like, all these things kind of tie together. But, like, understand that if your employee makes a mistake, don't bring it up two years later. Like, it's over. Like, solve it, move on. Every time you go back to something, you're just bringing negative energy into the company, you're beating people down, all of those other things. Like, move on. It's much, the future's way more fun than, you know, Bruce Spring glory days, right? Like, glory days are fun, but you can't, they don't make any money, right? So, um, so this is the other one, and we've been talking about it through this whole thing, but building a culture is, particularly with the, the generation, and I, I happen to be a big fan of, you know, millennials is a big, broad thing, because they're, they're, millennials are old at this point, right? They're in their 30s, they're having kids, they're buying houses. So, but that's just a general, like, over, like bucket. Um, but when we started a company, nobody talked about culture, right? You just had a company, and you sold, and you had employees, and then we worked from, you know, 8 in the morning till 10.30 at night, and no one talked about culture and, you know, volunteering and doing fun things and having a meaning and giving back and making it fun and all that stuff. Fun, you don't have fun at work. You go to work to make money, and then, you know, then you go home at 10.30 at night. You've got to get up the next morning and come back to work, and that's five days a week. That is just a grind. Like, it's way better to have a fun culture. And the one thing I will tell you is, is, and this is kind of interesting, when I talked about people's websites, when we redid our website you know, a few years ago, and we're going to redo it again, we had, you have the ability now to be able to track where people go on your website, and there are heat maps and way above my pay grade, but you can figure this stuff out. But the number one place people went was to our culture page. They looked at the, they read the stuff in the beginning, and they spent all this time on our culture page because that's the only credible thing about your business is your culture page because you're showing the volunteer work and you're showing what people are doing and you're recognizing their activities. You know, we put up like little um, bios on each person, and they, you know, what's your dream vacation? And one guy said, you know, I want to go on a gay cruise, right? great. Like, you know, my son was like, that's awesome. That's what he wants to do. Like, he was empowered to do that. Like, you know, uh, you know, we have quotes, you know, and, you know, and so, so people go there because they learn about the people they work with. It, it personalizes your business, but you have to build a culture today or your business is, is not going to survive because the generation today, to their credit, want to have meaning at work and you want to have fun and you want to do these other things. Um, so here's some, you know, some culture stuff that, you know, we have done. We, you know, we've adopted, like, schools on the Lower East Side, and we're, we're Santa to them. So we buy their holiday gifts. We wrap them. Joe Carey in our office gets up with Santa. We go down. We give out gifts. Um, the picture there on the right were people in scarves. Um, we took $5,000, and we sent teams of people out on the streets of New York, and we empowered them just to do surprise and delight and go into, an, into a bar and buy someone a beer or buy someone a, you know, a, a gift or buy them lunch or do whatever. You know? And it wasn't about giving to homeless people, and there's plenty of those in New York or whatever, and we did some of that too. Um, we had blankets we were giving away. But it was just a fun way to get people to go out. And it's really weird. When you try to give people money, they think you're going to kill them, right? Like, <laughs> like, 
here's twenty dollars. Take it. No, no, no. Like they're like, what? and then, but we had a little card and it said, no, no. This is this is this is a little surprise for your holiday gift, and we gave some to kids, and it was awesome for five thousand dollars. You know, we believe we're pretty charitable, but it was a great way, you know, to do stuff. Um, talk about empowering people. This is Johanna Gottlieb, who um, runs our uh, Chicago office and is uh, also um, does the mentoring for uh, Promo Kitchen. So everybody here, sign up for the mentoring stuff. It's great. Um, she's, she's like, we would be $100 million if we could just have more Johannas. But Johanna did this thing, and she, she sent this email around. She said, who saved your fucking ass this week? And the, her idea was, is like, tell me who did something for you this week, like from our suppliers. Could be somebody on the floor, could be someone you know, in operations or whatever it is. And she writes handwritten thank you notes to those people. She goes to Target and buys just boxes of cards, sends them handwritten thank you notes. You would think we were sending them money because they just got a thank you note saying, you did something for me. Like, this is the kind of culture that you want to build, that somebody in your company says, I want to do this, and can I do this? She's on maternity leave. Other people have picked it up, and now other people are doing it. So pretty cool. Um, she's up for some uh, award here. Um, she's a finalist for, I should know this. Oh, well, epic fail. Um, <laughs> so, so here's where uh, I'll give you some keys to like how Axis does stuff. Um, the only thing I would ask you is if, if we compete anywhere, don't use any of these things for the way we compete. Uh, so I want to challenge you all today to stop thinking about just products and start thinking about taglines, right? So putting your client's logo on a piece of drinkware, all right, it's fine. But make the drinkware fun and relevant. If you look at social media and what's, what's out there in retail and we do, it's all about statements. And you see sweatshirts, all these statements on it. And, uh, Parvane is nodding her head. She's she's amazing. She does all these trend reports, and you know, so you know, she's happy to share. I'm sure. But like, that's about strategy, right? What's the messaging that ties that piece of drinkware or whatever it is into something? You know, you know, wipe the smile off your face. It's it's a funny napkin, right? You made someone smile with a paper napkin, right? That's amazing. Like, you know, don't be a stranger. Um, you no, know, taglines can highlight the benefits of the brands and demonstrate the value that you're trying to do. So we try to do this a lot with what we do because a tagline can make it memorable, highlight a key benefit, differentiate the brand, you know, and it imparts positive feelings, right? So, you know, Apple think differently. These are some of their taglines. I'm loving it. But then you get into other stuff. So here's a campaign that we did for American Express that, you know, kind of made us famous in, within the tower. Um, they came to us and said, we're trying to get in to see CFOs of corporations. And you know, we've been trying to call them. We've trying to do those things. And we came up with this dimensional mail campaign. And we wrote these taglines. Put yourself in the driver's seat. It's a remote control car, right? But we didn't send the remote control with the car. We sent the remote control to the salesperson. So CFO, 40-year-old, mostly men at the time, like they get this great toy, but they can't play with it until they meet with somebody, right? So that's great, right? Um, we said to them, what are the, some of the other issues that people have? Because you know, they want you to use the American Express card so that they can do the charges and it makes you managing their expenses a lot easier. And they said, well, you know, we feel like people are like, you know, they're so busy and they're, they're not doing their stuff, but if we can get them to use the American Express card, we can save them time and money. And so we wrote this tagline, does managing T&A require to juggle the demands of your business? And we did these juggling balls. And there's, a, there's another overlay that went Thomas said, let American Express give you a helping hand. Now, they were working with a branding, they were working with an agency on this, we presented these items with the taglines, and the agency called and said, can we use your taglines with the product, right? Kudos to us. They got, they got to bill them probably $10,000. We got nothing but you know, <laughs> sales out of it. But it made a difference because had I just presented a remote control car, they'd be like, that, like what does that do for us? But when you say, put yourself in the driver's seat, they're like, huh. I get that, right? We had an hourglass, and they, you know, they, it was a brass hour, like, well, we did an hourglass, they said, we just need two minutes. If we can get in front of them for two minutes, we know that we can convince them. They're like, okay, so how do I present, I mean, that's like a no-brainer, we'll set up, we'll do a clock, we'll do a watch, whatever, but it, you know, they were kind of cheapy, and so we had this brass hourglass, and the, the copy said, before two minutes are up, you know, and then you opened it up, and there was another statement, and it was phenomenally successful, right? And, but if I'd shown this little brass hourglass to the buyer at Amex who, you know, I, she was pretty creative, but she would never have said, oh, that's a great idea, but writing the tagline made a difference, right? Be prepared for the road ahead, right? You know, it's a, it's a kit, right? 
like, this was a regional thing, right? Do these things in New York City. People are like, why would you give me a road kit? No one has a car, right? So, but you need to understand those things, but be prepared for the road ahead makes a difference in terms of what the product is. So, some of you, many of you are creative, but then I always get this question, but I'm really not that creative and I'm not a good writer and I don't know how to do this. So let me share to you that, and I'll give you permission, steal other people's ideas. It's brilliant. Um, so uh, these are all things that recently I have found, right? So um, the, the thing that looks like a charger right there, your phone thing, you know, more power to you, right? That's from, I saw that in the JetBlue terminal, and I was like, boy, that would be great to put on a power bank, right? Hey, well, I'll take that, I'll, you know, stick that in my, you know, my thing, and uh, surprise and delight. How many people talk about their business? That's what we're in, right? We're in the surprise and delight business. You know, that's great. You know, some things just go better together. Peanut butter and jelly, we did a whole direct mail campaign of that. Cheers to that, better than a lump of coal. Forget something, we have your back, right? But you can change that, like, we have your back, is an amazing statement to say to your clients, right? Stressed, we have your back. Challenged, we have your back. All of these other things in terms of your messaging to your clients. Now, it's not like rocket science, right? But like, I, like you can find ideas everywhere, right? So here's the power bank thing, more power to you. This was in a, uh, this was in a mini bar, right? Bite me, right? How funny would that be if you sent candy to somebody and said, bite me? Right? You know, dig in, give in, like all of these things, you know, it's creative, right? Like, like that's a retail packaging. Why can't you use that to your clients? It's not, you know, it's, I mean, look, you can completely disagree, and if you do, keep it to yourself. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the bite me part is like, you know, I, I kind of like that. It's kind of a little edgy and, you know, or live it up. Any of those things, go nuts, right? All fun, but, you know, so I stick these things in folders. I put it on a Pinterest page that I have to, to remember these things. Um, who knows about Dormify? Anybody know Dormify? Um, if you don't know it and you have younger kids, save a lot of money because this is, this is a business that is designed to help you decorate your kids' dorm room. Um, a friend of mine runs this company, so I didn't tell her I'm stealing her stuff, but, uh, you know, so we look at this, this is just one website. We go to, we, we, sh we are on all sorts of websites all over the place, but like, you know, wake up, kick ass, sleep, repeat, right? Kind of fun on a tote bag. You put their client's logo on the other side. People will carry that tote bag, right? Maybe not everywhere, right? It's a little, it's a little irreverent, but you know, go to the next one, but coffee first, right? So they have but coffee first on a pillow. Why don't you put but, but coffee first on a mug, right? Easy, right? You're just looking at the websites and you're, and you're taking some of this stuff in. Um, you know, this one, uh, you know, is it a high tide, let's just say? Uh, high tide's good vibes, right? Great to go on a, on a tote bag or anything else if someone's going on a, on a trip somewhere. Um, we didn't do this one, but we used this before. Um, you know, something that we did with, uh, with Peerless and we did umbrellas. Um, and on the umbrella we put, make your own sunshine, right? How great is that? You open up an umbrella and it says that, and other people on the street see this, this fun, Thing. This is make your own sunshine, crappy day, rainy, make your own sunshine. So we did this before this, this, this thing came out, but it's just an example of, had we not done it before, I would have said, that's a perfect thing to put on an umbrella or something like that. Um, don't quit your daydream, right? Put it, on a, put it on a notebook, right? So you guys, you get the point, right? It's, it's, you can find this stuff everywhere. You just have to keep your mind open to these things. And, you know, you have a phone. It's so easy to keep track of these things. So now I've got you thinking about, like, how to build a company, how to think about taglines. And so now I want to challenge you to not do just the stuff business. Like, we have the ability to sell anything to anybody that's not any product that we can't get, and there's not anybody we can't sell to. But it doesn't mean it's easy to get in there, but once you're in there, you've got to figure out a creative way to get in. And this is what we've done, I think, really well, and it's really been part of our business, you know, uh, forever. So everybody recognize this box, right? They're a massive company. We would never, ever, ever send out a box like this. And by the way, I, I think they do an amazing job with their business. Just completely different than our business, right? Just different philosophy about how they do stuff, everything else. So I'm not criticizing the company. I'm just saying they're sending out a box of stuff, 
right? And they're, the buyers, they're go, they, I mean, what are they, over $400 million or something like that? So can't really complain. But the people they're selling to are like, they just want to see some basic stuff. Oh, I like that pen. I'm going to get that pen. Like, I do not want to be in that business. And I will challenge you today, you do not want to be in that business because you are going to lose, right? The internet is flattening everything out. They're better at it than you are. They're more efficient at it. They're buying better than you are. So what I wanted to challenge you to do is I want you to sell stuff like this, right? And again, this is, I'm showing you some things that we've done. This was a kit that we did for our 25th anniversary you know, that we did for people, and it's a, it's a tube, and we did, you know, cocktail shaker, and the tagline was shaking things up for 25 years, and the recipe cards were a recipe by each person in the company, got to name a recipe they liked. Um, you know, the, the logo was, was very faint on it, so it didn't, you know, if you're gonna keep it at your bar, right, at home, you don't wanna see Axis in big blue letters anywhere, why would you want that? Um, you know, here's another thing, you know, this is a, you know, like one of the, the tracker, right? So we did this thing and like, you know, so glad we found you. And you know, it was kind of like, we never want to lose, like we want to thank you, we never want to lose you. Easy copy, nothing that crazy, but we took a basic item, we put a belly band around it and we sent it out of the package, great response, pretty easy breezy, right? Um, this is another kit that we did, um, make every day your B-Day and you know, so we had candy, we had this, you know, this cool mug, like, um, and we had this clip, and then we had cards, and it was like, you know, be energized, and, we, and each day you could change what, you, what, your, what your goal was, and we allow people to do that. But again, in the packaging and in the messaging, you know, we try to get people to think about things differently, and we're trying to get people to say they're creative, they're strategic, they're doing fun stuff. If you can get your clients thinking that way, you're gonna be successful. Like, you're gonna sell, you're gonna have days where you're just gonna sell them. Look, this is not how we spend all of our days, right? Like, like we're still 80, 20, 85, 15. You know, we talk about strategy all the time. At the end of the day, it's still gonna end up being, you know, uh, a toddy wedge or it's gonna be something from Snugs or whatever it is, because that's gonna be the right item and they don't need a big full-blown package. But when we send something out to our clients, we are sending something out with a message, with a purpose, getting them to think about us differently than, um, than our competition, right? And some of you are a competition, but... Um, so here's one, this is kind of a funny story. So we knew just from reading, remember a few years ago, co like coloring books were all the rage, and you went on Amazon, it's all about stress and everything else. And I, I kind of was into this, like I'm a big doodler, so I was kind of like, wow, the coloring books, that would be really fun. And I had this idea about like, our clients are, like think about holiday gifts, our clients are stressed, you know, wouldn't it be fun to do something around coloring books? So I said, well, maybe we'll do something like that. Um, and I had this thing on my desk that, for like two years, it's a hand that holds pencils and it's magnetic on the side. And it'd been sitting there and I was like, you know what, well, maybe we'll put coloring pencils in the hand and then we'll do the coloring thing together. And then, so we created this whole kit that looked just like that, right? Um, and the tagline was stress, let us give you a helping hand. How many of your clients aren't stressed? So we did this kit, we got a great response. Um, Quick story, I was at this, uh, this event and the, the head marketing guy from SoulCycle was there. And I went up, I just want to introduce myself. We do work for them. And he said, I want, I'm from Axis. He goes, he goes, you're the Axis? He goes, I have to tell you a story. He goes, I saw this idea, you know, that, that this coloring book thing. And I went into our marketing department. And he goes, we are going to be so hot this summer because in the Hamptons, we're going to do this kit. And we're going to send out these, these coloring books. And I want you to go out and find someone to do coloring books. And they all went, I mean, like this. And like, they all had these kits at their desk. And he goes, he goes, so there I was thinking that I was the smartest guy in the room, but you were the smartest guy in the room. And he said in front of all these people, and I was like, can you do that over again? Yeah, okay. So I'm getting the, I'm getting the time thing, so I'm just going to keep going. Um, more taglines, level, like tools, right? You know, raise the level of your marketing, right? You know, every drop counts, so it's a water bottle. You know, make your own mark, it's a great pen. Um, this is a direct mail kit. Um, this is a breakfast in bed kit. You know, relax, we've got you covered, it's a blanket. We did a cereal, we did a little newspaper. Chill, escape. Um, so this is what our real motto is, is that we want to make, we want our client, we want to look good by making our clients look good. So every day, if we can do that for them, then we're going to be a success, I think, right? And it's what drives us. Um, 
So these are just some fun kits, something we did for, the, uh, for NBC. Here's a drone kit. So remember, the, remember the remote control car kit? Now we're doing a drone for Seamless without the remote. Uh, Zappos, um, you know, Eat Sleep Bravo. Um, so you can see how much we think about packaging in terms of stuff we do with our clients. It's a big differentiator, but it's gotten to be so easy. This was, we gave away oranges. We branded oranges. You know, we had a brilliant idea. We could laser engrave them, and they, they look great for about 12 hours. Um, <laughs> uh, they turned brown, and that was a bad idea. But we, we, we tested it out and learned. Um, we got a call from a client. We made SpongeBob mailboxes for the postal service. Um, so anyhow, this is kind of the end of, you can see all the different kits that we've done. That's kind of um, it for me. Um, so, I'm probably like 45 minutes over time. No, you were, it says zero, zero here. Is that, is that true? I didn't even know that was, yeah, that was zero, there for. Zero. I didn't know what that the thing was for. Everyone, Larry Cohen. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, as an entrepreneur, have looked up to this guy for so long because he wow. started a business. I know it's BS. <laughs> I know it's BS. Yeah, but don't honestly, believe that. We bring speakers here that speak to us personally. And here's a guy who started a business from this and grew it to this size. I remember speaking to you in New York, what, two months ago. I visited your office and you go and it's this hive of activity. And you're the same guy at 50 million. I know it's a big fancy number that you were at 500 grand. Well, I think good. that's amazing. So Thank not believing your own bullshit. Yeah, it's great, it's true. and uh, it's 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 very true. So we're.